Well, for big fans of crossover episodes, uh, we're going in early. This is an introduction. This is me and Michelle talking about, uh, well, West Indies cricket, but we're going to do it on my podcast and we're going to do it on his. So whichever podcast you're listening to, whether it be West Indies on 99.94 or Red Inca, that was an introduction of sorts. There's no Santoki today. I'm I'm Santoki. They're slightly louder and probably talk more than him. Uh, and I won't say 100% as much as he do, although now, maybe now I will, um, that I said it out <laughs> loud. Uh, but we're going to talk about something that I'm th- pretty sure that you and I care about more than Santoki does, but he might care about it as well. So you guys, I'm sure you'll have to cover it many times. But the fact that West Indies at the one time has the fastest white ball scorer in the world, and we're going to ignore him to talk about the slowest white ball scorer in the world, Shy Hope who in my notes I've got here is the anti Dre Russ. Now you said something in an episode recently, and I can't remember if it was about, it might've been, it might've been when talking about the one day team and how much they've been struggling. And you said, I'm not going to cuss out shy hope because he's actually making runs and no one else is. It's not so much that this episode is about cussing out shy hope, but it is probably, you know, uh, hanging a lampshade on the fact that he is an abnormally slow white ball scorer for modern cricket isn't he yeah m- most definitely and um it, it's it's a weird one jared because I, and i'm I'm going to be intrigued to see where you stand in it from a neutral perspective and obviously i know that you've you've done the 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 kind of recent video um pod uh looking at looking at shea and his strike rate but the reason i'm intrigued to see where you stand in it from a neutral perspective is because it's it's a I wouldn't say it's a hot topic in the Caribbean. It's it, it, it has its peaks and its troughs. So in the recent mm. ODI series defeat to India, in the midst of getting destroyed by them, it, it, it peaked again, where inexplicably people wanted to say that one of the reasons why we weren't competing with India was because Shea wasn't striking at a competitive enough strike rate. And, uh, and yeah, you were right. On our pod, I just highlighted that of all the myriad of issues... West Indies having a ODI cricket. Uh, don't get me. And the thing is, it is an issue. It is an issue. Yeah. But of but of all the myriad of issues, I think it's currently somewhere somewhere near the bottom to to deal with rather than at the top. But if we were if we were a good white ball, sorry, and if we were a good ODI side, I do think mm. we would have to unpick in even more depth what on earth is going on. I was trying to work out like what it's like. It's almost like complaining that you don't have enough leg room on a flight that's about to ditch into the ocean. Like <laughs> at a certain point, you're right, and I'm sure it is uncomfortable, but you probably have bigger uh, concerns. But at the same time, this is, it is, uh, the only reason I made the video, I think I started the video before you guys mentioned it on, on your pod. And I'm mm-hmm. looking at the numbers and I've got, I like an outlier on a, on, on a chart, right? And, you know, you've got Viv Richards as an obvious outlier. You've got Shahida Freedy. Uh, you've got Joss Butler, uh, Jeff Marsh, uh, who's also in that video, uh, just so I could talk about how he used to cover drive naked, um, hovering over his, um, hovering over his uh, 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 teammate who was sleeping in the bed beside him. Imagine waking up to, like, Jeff Marsh's fucking junk just, drifting towards you as he plays a cover drive. But that's a whole other thing for, for another time. But but Hope is certainly almost off the charts at the bottom. His strike rate, the only player I could find that was really close to him, and this player started a long time before him, I think was William Porterfield. Now, William mm. Porterfield was a very good, solid player, but he he's almost from another era of Irish cricket. He was probably almost of that sort of amateur through to semi-professional era. There was no other major cricketer who scores that slow. It is so noticeable that he has started. When did I reckon his first one day was what twenty fifteen? Uh, twenty sixteen, Zim. Uh, uh, I think we went on a tour to play a tri series versus Sri Lanka in Zimbabwe. Yeah, so his first test was twenty fifteen, wasn't it? Oh, so, twenty fifteen, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, for a test, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. So yeah, twenty sixteen for ODIs. I couldn't find another player who started in that period who doesn't have a pretty good strike rate. But I also couldn't find many players in that period who who um who played one day cricket and had that kind of record, right? Because it is. I mean, he averages almost 50. It feels mm. it feels unfair to target him, except for the fact that a strike rate of 78 was slow when Jonathan Trott was batting at that. And that was a long time ago. Uh, uh, what makes it 
more peculiar for me is that you can find instances through i think how many is it is it uh I think he's a hundred he's over a hundred what odis now so he's been around he's actually been around for a while now and you can find instances throughout the 100 plus odis that he's played where he has gone at a strike rate over 100 it's not many but there are instances of mm. it and there's been a few instances in t20 cricket again few where he's gone at a strike rate which suggests he has that potentially in his locker. So it's more perplexing to me simply be. it would be one thing if he did it and that's all he could do. So, you know, kind of like Craig Brathway or Tej Narayan Shandapal early in their career, it's like, well, that's all they can do. They 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 can only grind it out. Craig Brathway played that um, that century against England where he was there forever um, in that in the in the recent test series, however many balls, six, five hundred, six hundred balls, whatever it was um, mm. that. We, that's all he can do, if that makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, Shea he, has I shown hope, on hope occasion... He's not Dom Sibley, is he? Right, exactly. Um, and he has shown on occasion that he's capable of going at a better strike rate. So it's more perplexing that he is... I am of the opinion he is doing it deliberately. But I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 gonna... Is he playing within himself I... on purpose? I want to come to that at the end because I think that's really interesting. Let's start with the the, the plane crash analogy from before, which is ODI one day um, cricket. They have been in a terminal decline for 20 years. Um, mm. I'd have to go back to 1999 World Cup to have a look at how they were doing then. But I think I looked at the last 20 years and you look at their win loss percentage and they've had little spikes back up, but it's basically just getting worse and worse and worse. There is something that sometimes happens with players when they play in a team like that and they end up, I mean, you could have said that Chanderpaul was a similar sort of player um, for um, the test team at times where it's just like at a certain point, you're just like, well, I'm just going to be the one who makes runs and yeah. everything else is just going to have to sort itself out around me. But this is a terrible, terrible moment for West Indies one day cricket. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that they had a little bit of luck against Scotland to even make a world cup. Right. And, you know, right, exactly. would you bet on them to make the next World Cup at the moment? I don't know. Um, it, we're going to leave that one in the hands of the gods again. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean... So, so this is on, bad, isn't it? It's a bad one-day team. It is. It is. And this is why I sometimes cut Shea a bit of slack. Because... <sighs> Look at the talent talent or lack thereof around him. And what you have to ask yourself is, who else in that side is capable of batting? I don't even want to say, let's say long. Who else in that side is capable of batting long at a good enough strike rate consistently? And the, the, the reality is the answer is no one. But if you're going to pick some names, at a push you'd pick Evan Lewis, who obviously doesn't make himself available anymore. Shimron Hetmeyer, who sometimes makes himself available. Nicholas Puran, who's now the captain. But with the best, with the best will in the world and with respect to those three guys, and yes, they all average over 35, but with respect to them, they aren't, I don't see them as consistent players who average over 35. They just so happen to average over 35, but maybe there are one in every three or one in every four performer. So if you're Shea Hope and you know that the batting around you from one down to seven is at best a one in every three games performer, I don't think you can change the way you bat. And I think I have to echo something that you said in in like your 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 video pod the the other day. At least if he does what he's doing, we might see out the 50 overs. So so you, mm. you have to you have to weigh it up. What's better? The guy who can drop anchor at 82 on a good day helps you get to 250, 60 if you 250, 260. Are you likely to defend that? No, but at least at least there's something, at least there's something on the scorecard to try and get behind. So and I think and I've pulled like the raw numbers, Jared. The 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 numbers speak for themselves in so much as when Shea makes runs, we have a better chance of winning. And the, the raw numbers mm. actually prove that. And in fact, probably more important than, than that is the inverse. When Shea doesn't make runs, we're 
we're really definitely not winning, <laughs> if, that make, if that makes sense. And so the numbers do support the tactic, so to speak. Yeah, and, and it kind of goes in both ways as well. So it, he has to make the runs. There, I think you and I both know there isn't a one-day player in West Indies domestic cricket who's going to come in and average 40-plus most yeah. probably, right? Unless they do it at an even slower strike rate than him. They're not going to do it <laughs> at, a, at a higher strike rate. And then the other problem is, I, I, you're right, he gets them in games and he gives them a chance, which is that's what the anchor does, right? It limits your mm. top end, but it means that you make consistent runs. The problem with the West Indies is, I don't think batting is their worst part of, of ODI no. cricket. I think their bowling has probably been worse. And, and when you look at the numbers, it certainly looks a lot worse on paper. Um, and so... Even if he's keeping them in games, it looks worse because there's, you know, the, Sheldon Cottrell isn't taking a bunch of wickets at the top and Sonal Narayan isn't, isn't playing, you know, with, with people's minds and Obed doesn't do the same thing that he does in, in uh, T20 cricket, right? So you don't actually have the bowlers to back him up anyway. And so in some ways that's not his fault because if his job is to be like the guy who can bat long, as you said, um, and get them to those mediocre but consistent totals again and again. It's not his fault if no one else in the team um, can actually, you know, score any runs, and if the bowlers can't take any wickets. I agree. I agree with you. But then, let me put the cat amongst the pigeons, so to speak. If you know Please. that your bowlers can't do anything, or can't, again, can't. There's so many elements of this team that can't consistently perform. But, but if you know, if you know your bowlers can't consistently, although they have literally just performed against New Zealand, but if you know your bowlers can't consistently perform to reduce scores under 300, does that mean then that Shea should up his strike rate? Because doesn't it, In uh, some would argue, come on, uh, the only way we're going to win is if we get scores of over 330. I mean, recently against India, mm. we put up scores above 300 and couldn't defend them because, as you correctly point out, Jared, the bowling isn't strong enough to to defend even if we get over like a 315. Our bowlers might defend one in every 10 scores that we make over 300, so to speak. So there is an argument to say that if the stats show that we struggle to defend and I'm not even counting 310 as a big total, but in West Indies, you have to count as a big total. There's an argument to say, actually, Shay, you go in at 85 and score in 100 off 132 balls, that's not going to cut it. And again, let's be honest, Jared, if a if a batter is going at... Shay did this against Inja recently, in fact. Let me, let me see if I've got it in front of me. Um, which one was it? Yeah, so... Recently against Inja, he made 115 off 135 balls, right? Um, and he went at 85. But I remember that innings. And the reason why I remember it is because he was stuck in the 80s for a long time. And that's what caused the cuss out in the Caribbean because people saying you're, you're being selfish. By the time you're in the 80s and you've already faced 115 balls, get a move on. So that's, why, I'm, that's mm. why it's good to speak to you as a neutral. Where do you stand on that aspect? So, yes, we know what he does, but what about when he gets to the 80s and the 90s and he's still not accelerating at the back end? It's a very fair thing to say. And I think, interestingly enough, I compare him to Jeff Marsh, uh, who I talked about before, naked um, batting in your hotel room. Uh, and Jeff Marsh did usually accelerate at the end. So Jeff Marsh would be, you know, Jeff Marsh's strike rate in one day cricket is 55. And if you think, well, one day cricket back in those days. No, no. Jeff Marsh was slow by that period. Like even in that period, Jeff Marsh was slow. Um, and, but if you, you know, and this is anecdotally because we don't have as much ball by ball data when it comes to him. I remember him hitting out at the end, right? If he got to 70 and 80 and, you know, he would start to hit out. I think that is a very fair thing with hope. So just to flip it a little bit, let's talk about that mm. 310 mark, though, you keep talking about, right? Yeah. Can they score 310 without him in the team? Will he consistently average 50 or 40 if he's striking at a run a ball rather than, a, you know, 0.8 runs a ball? Um, are the, are, or the, is their best hope, and pardon the pun, not 
he makes 100 off 125 balls and it's horrible and we all wish it didn't happen. But at the other end, off the other, other 180 balls, the rest of the guys score 220 because that's literally the format of cricket that they're better at anyway. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying he's right and I'm not saying that is what I would tell the team as an analyst, but is there a part of you that goes, if we're going to make 300, maybe we just need one guy to bat 40 overs and have a bunch of guys swing at the other end? Yes, and... I mean, let's let's make this clear. I'm in favour. I'm actually in favour of what Shea is currently doing. Um, my And the wider concern, um, echoing your point here, is that the other batters who should be doing what you're saying they should be doing don't seem to have the game to bat around Shea. Like, if really and truly, Shea should be a godsend to those batters. Like, imagine you know that you've got a batter at the other end who basically, what, maybe six times out of ten, if not seven, is going to occupy the crease and take it deep. That's what any team should really want in the, in the, in the 50 old format, admittedly at a better strike rate. That's essentially freeing you up to play your natural game. The problem is these other players around Shea, their natural game seems to be, right, I faced my obligatory 20 balls, I'm out. Well, <laughs> Hmm. Whereas I need to like face 50 balls at least or something like that. So the, the, the critique is that the other players around him don't seem to know how to construct 50 over innings. And again, I go back to the video podcast you, you did on your channel. I think you made a comment on there where you said, I can't remember who you were referencing it to, but 50 over cricket is more difficult than people realize. Um, and I think some of our players are caught in that that kind of no man's land between yes I can I can produce a 20 so Romario Shepherd can produce a uh, a four, uh, a 15 ball 40 in 2020 cricket but yeah. finds it hard to somehow make that adjustment to ODI cricket now you're better than me to tell me why it is you think they can't make that adjustment when in theory with a guy like Hope at the other end the freedom is there to try and do that yeah, I think that's interesting. I think what I'm what I was really getting at is it's longer than you think. Uh, mm. You know, you've played you've played club cricket, right? And you do if you've been playing a bunch of T20s and you play a fifty over game, suddenly there is a you lose one wicket and the team starts to panic, and you realise yeah. that why that Jeff Marsh anchor position was built was Australia going well. What we can do here is guarantee the fifty overs more often than not, and that's mm. why Hope is doing that. But you're right; it's like there is a certain freedom amongst the batters. When If they have to hit 40 off 15, they know they're going to fail two or three times. That's not what one-day cricket is, though. Even if you're mm. trying to think of... Even if you're Lance Klusner or Shahid Afridi, you're still expected to average over 25, yeah. aren't you, right? You know, and that's the whole Glenn Maxwell thing of... I don't think Cricket Australia have ever quite understood Glenn Maxwell because they're like, we, we want you to average 45. And he's like, but I want to average 35 with a strike rate of 120. And, yeah, and so yeah. there is that sort of constant conflict i think in one day cricket it was actually i remember when i talked to nicholas puran um during the 2019 world cup so i had about an hour uh, with him at one of the hotels and we, we were chatting about stuff and he was saying that and his his situation is different from some of the other guys as you and i know he didn't play a lot of one day cricket but mm -hmm. he did say that it is a different form of white ball cricket because you don't have the freedom and you don't have the ability to just go out and hit so you're trying to find that what 40 or 30 magic mark, right? Yeah. The sort yeah, of Andrew yeah. Simons type innings or Lance Klusner type innings. And what you're not trying to do is the Shahid Afridi innings, right? Yeah. And I wonder if, because a lot of these West Indian players do not play enough list A cricket, that's not yeah. actually a skill they are learning enough. And I mean, I haven't looked. How, how many, off the top of your head, how, how many times would someone like Obed McCoy or Romario Shepard play list A cricket? cricket they probably wouldn't have more than 30 games would they if we even if we'd up? not even on no, even if we'd not had the pandemic in list a cricket you're playing seven games a year eight if you're lucky yeah um one super 50 in the year and that's it unless you happen to go abroad and if even if you take someone like a romario shepherd he's now getting franchise deals everywhere so he's not even going to be playing club 
50 over cricket and in the Caribbean our club cricket is 40 overs anyway so that it echoes the point Jared they're not even learning how to construct a 50 over innings so in many ways we're getting on well we're not but people are getting on Shay's back for the crime of knowing how to construct a 50 over yeah exactly <laughs> how to construct a 50 so over innings thought... when others don't know yeah and and yes and, and we'll continue to talk about the slowness because you can't not but he he's getting he he's getting it's sort of like that you know you watch a basketball game or a, or a football game and you've got a player out there who dribbles too much you know with the mm. ball and everyone's like oh my god just pass it what are you doing we're forgetting that he's looking around sometimes and going well who am i batting with here uh yeah. you know shamar brooks i'm batting with shamar brooks right okay what's he going to do he's probably not going to make 70 or 80 i'm batting with i don't know I can't remember if Johnson, Charles, and, and I hope ever overlapped, but he's batting with what is obviously sub-international level white ball players. They're not bad players, and mm. some of them have other skills that are quite handy to the West Indies, but you're not, you're not looking at any of those guys and going, do you know what? These guys are going to average, as you said before, 35 plus consistently, um, and mm. they're not going to make any damage to the opposition. There is a point where that is affecting him. We'll talk about that more in a minute, just to, just because I looked it up. So Romario Shepard is almost 28 and he has played 48 list A games. And of those, 18 are uh, ODI. So what did I say? He wouldn't have played 30. He's played exactly 30 list A games right. outside so of go. the 18 internationals. Obed has played 21 and two of those are ODIs, right? And and it, it's the same with uh, Obed's a different kind of player. And we mm. know he's been injured and, you know, all those sorts of things. We don't even know how good a one-day player he will ever be because he's yep. he's not getting an, a, a lot of chance to work on his game there. Naturally, there's nothing you watch him bowl. There's nothing he does that shouldn't translate to the one-day game. Uh, he he's not played a lot of first-class cricket, so we don't know how he will go in red ball cricket. But he can bowl 85 to 90 mile an hour left arm pace, bang it into the pitch, and he's got variation. It's halfway there, right? And but you still have to develop that. And for whatever reason, hope did manage to develop that one little part of his game. And it does feel unfair picking on him for it, even if you and I are still baffled as to why he's not scoring quicker. Which which is why I go back to the earlier point then, Jared. It has I'm convinced it has to be deliberate. It's it's the it's the circumstances dictate what he can currently do. Now the test will be if this ODI side ever gets better, and it's a big if, that's mm. that's why I'm saying there will, hopefully, in his career, there will come a point where he has to change his game. But I don't think it's going to come anytime soon. And the other thing that's worth pointing out as well is you talk about, so you use the example of Romario Shepard. Um, the other thing that's quite notable is, so Hope, we said earlier on that Hope made his debut in the ODI team in 2016. So he's now had a six-year OGI career but you if you look at the rest of the players around him there's two noticeable things that people should pick out one they're actually all old they've all made their debuts in like the last <laughs> year and a bit and they're all 29 30 Shamar Brooks is 33 uh y Yannick Karaya just debuted he's 30 Jermaine Blackwood has just come in again he's 31 Mayers is 29 Akil Hussain is 29 Brandon King is so these players aren't they're all coming into the international scene late, but they're not even coming in off the back of having played a significant amount of games. So it's a double whammy. You're, some are saying, oh, that means they're mature, but international cricket is a completely different beast. And they're coming in at 30, having to suddenly adapt, <laughs> having to suddenly adapt to, to, the, to the rigors of international cricket. Where, and the, the, the reason I made that point about hope, hope, the reason I made the point about 2016 is Hope is now 28. So he's been playing this format since 22, at yeah. 22 years of age. And West Indies stuck with him. So he's he knows his game. Do, do you get where I'm coming from? Whereas all these other players are coming in, recent recruits, and I don't think they, they're still, they're learning on the job, in essence. Whereas Hope actually knows the game of OGI cricket, so to speak. Mm. No, I agree. I, I mean, 
It is incredible what you see a West Indian come into the team and you check their age. If they're under 28, you throw yourself a little party, don't you? Because um, that almost seems to be the magic age that they start picking all these guys. Because they have like one good season. They play a couple yep. of good, you know, um, club seasons in Trinidad or in Houston or something. Um, and then they, they get one good season and they get picked. And it's not, again, they haven't been developed properly. Let's get back to the selfish thing, right? Mm. Because that's the cuss out. And yeah. that is certainly where... When we talk about hope, so I can't remember when it was, but quite a few years ago, I was talking to someone in West Indies group, you know, quite, you know, quite an experienced senior sort of person uh, with, you know, decision maker is probably the best mm. way to put it. And we were talking about him and he was just like, he's selfish. <laughs> and so I, that's kept in my head. And so many yeah. fans say the same thing. It's kept in my head. So when I do the research for this thing, the first thing I work out is if he's selfish, why is he so crap at T20 cricket? He averages less than 20 in T20 cricket with a strike rate of 117. This is off the top of my head, so I hope I've got those two numbers right. Averages about 19 and a half at a strike rate of 117, right? Hmm. If he was selfish, I would at least expect him to be averaging 25 or 27, right? Or he averaged 20, but maybe he's got a strike rate of 130. There does feel to me, and I, I looked up test cricket, because again, I never think of him as a slow scoring batter in test cricket. You mentioned before, you know, Sibley and Brathwaite and, you mm. know, and Chandra Paul and all these sorts of people. And I looked up his strike rate in, um, in test cricket. It's like, it's bloody slow, mate. It's really, yeah. really slow. And so I'm just going to park that. I'm just going to put that to you there that he bats slow in all formats and in T20 cricket, which, which, He's also called selfish. If he's being selfish in T20 cricket, then it's the worst form of selfish, of selfish behavior I've ever seen. So this is interesting because I saw an innings, was it last year? It, apologies if I have it wrong, people. So it was either last year's CPL or the year before that when he was playing for Barbados Royals, where I actually now I can vividly picture this innings in my head where he made like, I don't know, 20 off 19 from the top one of those match losing innings so i i hear this i definitely hear this and i can picture some of his 2020 innings this now begs the question <laughs> this is gonna be a weird point i put to you is his range of shots limited because mm. maybe that's the problem but then whenever you speak to people about shea Hope, the first thing they say is glorious cover drive oh he's such a classy player but Maybe we need to dig a bit deeper and maybe he hasn't got a lot of shots in. It. I don't know, by the way, I now need to, I'm, I'm now testing myself. Yeah. I need to go back and look again. Maybe he hasn't got the range of shots to be anything other than what he is. So he's, again, he's playing within his limitations, but those limitations don't work in test cricket because he gets found out. I hope he's able to overcome that, but his career thus far, he's been found out. And T20 cricket, mm. he doesn't have the range of shots to consistently go at, I don't know, 140. Um, uh, a strike rate of, of a 140. Whereas OGI cricket, whatever the quirks of OGI cricket are. No, but then no, no, actually, Jared, I take that back because it's not that he's got a game for OGI cricket. He's got the game for the West Indies version of OGI cricket. I don't think yeah. he's actually got the game for OGI cricket either. <laughs> he's Does got that the game sense? for averaging 50. Yeah, he's got the game for averaging 50 in ODI cricket. He doesn't have the game for ODI cricket. You know, you would no one would pick him. Um, so no, you're completely right. I, I think the only other thing I would throw into all that is it might be that he's limited. He certainly struggles with seam bowling. Yes. Right? And and that that does seem to be a problem, especially in test cricket. I don't think he's particularly good against the short ball. So maybe it is limited. But here's the thing. I'm willing to say he's not selfish and that he's limited, right? Mm. But I'm going to flip this on you um, and, and drop this. You mentioned before that he doesn't actually score any quicker towards the end. Yeah. Now, I've already said that Jeff Marsh managed to do that. It, almost all the anchors in the world, and this is what an anchor player will always say to you, oh, yeah, you can't judge me when I go out after 20 balls. You've got to judge me when I go out after 80 or 120 balls because I'll have caught up, right? The mm. Dawid Milan theory, right? Yeah. He doesn't catch up, right? And and I do I, – I, look, let's say it takes – let's say he's, he's limited and it takes him 50 balls to get going. He still never gets to the level where I'm like, 
okay, well, he took a lot of balls up, but he's, he'll probably hit a couple of boundaries and a couple of forwards here and, and, and push hard with his runs. There doesn't ever seem to be that kick on that, that you would expect from an anchor who is well set. And that, to me, again, means he's even more limited than we think he is or he is incredibly selfish and even when he's already on 100, he won't put the team first. And I'm willing to say it's either, but there has to be a founding reason why he's playing that way. I want to be a, I want to give the answer. I really want to say I know. So again, I reference the most recent uh, iteration of him doing exactly what you said. So first uh, ODI versus in, uh, second ODI, sorry, uh, versus India uh, last month. Shea Holt made 115 from 135 balls and West, West Indies batted first, sorry, and made 311. Now that should have been enough to win the game. In the end, India chased that. Uh, they won by two wickets with three balls to spare, right? You go back and you look at Hope's innings. He was there. Hope was the last person dismissed in that innings. Um, sorry, he was dismissed when West Indies were 300 for six. So he was pretty much there till the to the, 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 the end. Yeah. I think it's criminal. If, you, if your team makes 311 and you're dismissed on 300, and you've done 115 of 135 and you end up losing by two wickets with three balls to go. Is it? Yes, Jared, it's easy to look at everybody else, but in a T20 context, you'd say that was a match mm -hmm. losing innings at the top of the, do you get, do you see what Definitely. I'm trying to say? And I don't want to be that guy because I, again, I have mm. to add that, in the context of West Indies LJ cricket, it's harsh to criticise Holt when there's so many other issues. But when you look at games like that, you have to question if that innings is actually as useful as the century makes it look. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're very accurate there. There's one thing you forgot to mention as well. He was the sixth wicket. Yes, sorry. There were <laughs> wickets in hand, right? Yeah. This is not, if he goes out and they're eight or nine down and he's had to carry the tail up to 311, there's a certain sense where you're like, wow, how many, how many risks can he take? Mm. Well, you look at that scorecard and you go, I think he could have taken some risks, right? Yeah. Now, I, I don't think we're ever going to get to the, the bottom of this. It'd be really interesting, you know, I mean, he's still so young to, to listen to how Heath talks about it. And I don't know if he ever will properly because he'll probably feel uncomfortable Here's my last question to you. Is it possible he's still West Indies' best ODI player for everything we have just said? I mean, at the end and of I the mean day. That, I want you to focus on the fact that he actually plays as well because not yeah. all of them do. <laughs> I, th I think at the end of the day, in an, in an era of white ball cricket where... We've got, we've got a player who averages over 50. It seems very churlish to turn round and say, you know what, he's not the best player in the side. Um, but I think you've made a point here. So actually, I'm not going to answer your question because I'm going to answer your question with this question. Would any other top ODI side take him? Because I'm really intrigued if other... Because people look at the average and go, well, of course we would. The average is 50, but would they... Would a top ODI side, so in England and India and New Zealand, okay, I guess Australia, would they take Shea Holt to open? Yes or no? Go through those four sides. Oh, no. Do you think he gets in them? He, I mean, based on strike late, England's not even picking up the phone, are they? They're not even asking <laughs> him if he's got a, a passport, right? Um, India have other anchors who can average the same and more at, what, 20-plus yep. strike rate? maybe even 25 plus strike rate, maybe even slightly more than that. Uh, New Zealand's an interesting one because New Zealand's game plan was set up around basically scoring, what, 260 to 300 and then allowing your bowlers to defend it. Yeah. That said, is there anyone in New Zealand with a strike rate that low? I wouldn't have thought so. Um, mm. And, you know, if you look at Taylor and Williamson, who were sort of their middle, middle over anchors, right? They both had a fifth gear. I'm not yeah. sure Hope has a third gear at this stage, right? Uh, Australia, I mean, 
no. They, I just can't. Um, and they, I think Australia almost rate anchors higher than anyone else. Yeah. And I cannot imagine them doing that. Uh, he's not getting into current day Pakistan either. Uh, South Africa love anchors almost as much as anyone outside of Australia at the moment. But again, I just think their anchors score at a quicker rate. Yeah. You're getting down to Ireland would poke your eye out to get him. And you don't really want you don't want to be in that situation. But I mean they're using Andy Belburney at number three. So yeah, they gotta they gotta take hope. Uh Bangladesh probably take him. That's fair, isn't it? I mean, they've yeah, got a lot of guys who score yeah, fairly yeah, yeah. slow as well. Yeah. Um I mean, at, at the very least, I'm not sure. I think he's in the mix for Bangladesh. Maybe that's the mm. better way of putting it, rather than they automatically take him. Sri Lanka probably need him because they have all the other guys smacking it everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I don't think he gets in, into that side either. So you're really left with maybe Bangladesh is a squad player who plays a little bit. Um, and Ireland he plays for. Um, and Afghanistan would take him. Right, because right. they'll take anyone so, who can average over thirty-five. That's not that's not the company you want to be in for your best player. Right. <laughs> so you <laughs> you've just answered the question. <laughs> the teams that you've you've gone through and said would take Shay in a in a in a heartbeat are all the teams down with West. Di- well, not Bangladesh in fairness because they they're actually quite a good old guy side these days. But it's all the teams down the end, down the bottom with West Indies in 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 the rankings. So. Like I say, it's churlish. It's churlish to look at Shea Hope in the context of West Indies cricket and say he's not our best player. But I think on in the to be fair and to be balanced, we'd also have to say on the flip side, but he's only good in the context of being in a subpar West West Indian yeah. team. And only if and only if and when that West Indian team gets better and they develop an engine room. Will we then see if Shay does have that that four four fifth gear in his locker to adapt to a changing side? But to be to be honest, Jared, I don't see him ever having to adapt the way he plays for an improving West Indies in his career because I don't think that time will come where he'll be asked to do anything no. other than he's actually doing. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to know what the conversations with Phil Simmons are on all of this, right? You know, uh, how much have they tried to move him forward? You know, even his his CPL franchises. So mm. there's one team I didn't mention actually, and it, and it brings us back to sort of the end, which is Scotland. Mm. If you were Scotland, and I know Kyle has just retired, I think from white ball cricket, hasn't he? Oh, he's retired from something anyway. Um, but but obviously, uh, Kyle. You would have had Kyle, George Munsey, and Callum McLeod. Kyle was never going to average as much as uh, as Hope, but has the ability to punish teams a little bit more at times. Mm. George Munsey is a wrecking ball um, who may never quite m- get the most out of himself because he's a bit of a late starter. Callum McLeod does a very similar role to Hope, except for the fact that we saw him absolutely destroy England. And we know he does have at the least, well, probably a fifth gear. It takes him a while to get into it because he's an anchor. That that top three, you'd say Hope probably gets in into their top four, let's say. But you're not sure where he fits into that. And I know Scotland have an abnormally talented top three for a non-test playing nation, right? But at the same time, Michelle, what are we talking about when we're even having to bring up Scotland? And there's a reason that the West Indies struggled to beat them uh, before the yeah. last World Cup, right? Um so, yeah, I don't think we've answered anything here today, but we've had a lot of fun. <laughs> but if you can ever get him on you get him on the podcast, uh, on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast one time, you've got to find out, like, how this happened and why this happens and whether he's happy with it. Because I, I feel like he's gone through – he's now one of the best ODI run scorers consistently. Yeah, exactly. Before, yeah, any of us, yeah. before anyone's really gone, well, wait a minute. How has he ended up making this many runs this slowly and this is a thing? He's got double the runs of the next best um, West Indian since he got into the side. He's literally batting on his own half the time. But it's good that you end here, Jared, because at the end of the day, we do still have to go back to the stats on paper. He's got 13 old GI hundreds and that's nothing to be sniffed at. Mm -hmm. And part of me thinks how many other players in world cricket would love to know do you know how many players in world cricket right now would love to end their career and go, I, I got 13 ODI hundreds um, at the end of my career. So we can't, 
we can't not give him his flowers, so to speak. But then how many players would turn around and go, well, if I was instructed to bat 85, I'd have 13 ODI, I'd have 13 ODI hundreds as well. So I, I, don't, I don't know which side of the, the line you, you lie on there. Uh, I mean, you and I have been on both sides of this line all the way through. I mean, the more I discuss it, the more confused I am. But I thank you very much for allowing me on your podcast. Thank you very much for coming on my podcast. And, uh, you know, good luck to, to hope in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, at the very least, wouldn't it be nice if he cracked 80 with that strike rate? You know, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a little boon to him at this stage? <laughs> he'll, probably, he'll probably end up averaging 60 in one day cricket with a strike rate of 82, and it'll just make us more confused. <laughs> listen thanks for having me on jared much and thanks for you coming to mine as well uh, much appreciated <laughs> <laughs>